Praise the Lord. Kindly seat. So welcome everyone to our uh, second session of Father Jesus Paul. So we had first session uh, day before yesterday in Salmia. This is the second session. Welcome everyone and welcome Father. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you for the nice songs. I would like you to sing one hymn to the Holy Spirit, short one. You know, we need the assistance of the Holy Spirit for anything that we do. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mary, our Mother, Saint Joseph, all the saints and angels in heaven, pray for us. I would like you to just stretch your hands towards me and say a little prayer of blessing in your mind. Just like the Holy Father, when he became Holy Father Pope Francis, he came to the public and shocked everybody when he said, before I give you blessing, I want your blessing. And the whole crowd blessed him. And he is our Holy Father leading the church. Because I am no one like the Holy Father. 
but I do need your blessing. Please stretch out your hand and say a prayer of blessing in your mind. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Please sit down. And thank you for your blessing. It's very important. Of course, um, the Lord is here with us. And uh, the verse that came to me as I was praying was Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 14. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. Anyone remembers what it is all about? It's about a woman, the greatest woman. Who is the greatest woman? Mother Mary. So what is written there is, after the ascension of Jesus giving instructions, wait for the Holy Spirit, she prayed with the disciples of Jesus, waiting for the Holy Spirit. Let me read that verse to you. Did you bring your Bibles, by the way? Those who have brought the Bibles, please keep them open in your, on your lap. I had requested uh, Abhi to tell everybody to bring the Bible. Did you tell them? Okay, so it doesn't matter if you didn't bring today. Next time when you come, please make sure you bring because that's very, very important. So here we are. All these, that is, all the 12 apostles or 11 apostles there. Yeah, all these with one accord devoted themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So very much we feel the presence of Mother Mary here among us. We also feel the presence of Jesus because as she's not told us in Matthew chapter 18, no, chapter 20, verse 18. What is that? Those who get it, please open and read at once. Chapter 20, isn't it 20? Verse 18. I hope so. Otherwise, I change my verse here. Praise the Lord. So it is chapter 18, dear friends. Mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Chapter 18, verse 19 and 20. Can you please read that for me? Chapter 18, Matthew 18, verses 19 and 20. Thank you. So, we are gathered in the name of Jesus. And we have gathered here to pray. And the Lord will grant us what we pray for. That's what he said there. Provided we agree among ourselves and pray. So, what do we agree among ourselves about? We want everyone here to be blessed by God. Everyone here to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit burning within us, moving within us. We want all of us to experience something special about our relationship with God. What else you want to agree about? We want every family, our families, to experience God's intervention. We want every hurt to be healed, every illness to be healed. Put as many things as you want, but put them together with one mind and heart. You know? So that's what Jesus says. Again, I say to you, believe in his words. If two of you, now we are many more than two, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Why? Because where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us at this time. We pray in your holy name that all of us may be blessed. 
may be comforted, may be healed, may be delivered, may be saved, may experience joy, peace, and love in abundance. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, now I would like to come to my topic today. You remember what it was supposed to be? It is God's love, forgiving and saving. Now don't get put off as soon as you hear God's love because every preacher, whenever any retreat comes, starts with God's love. First talk is about God's love, isn't it? Now this is our second talk. Uh, but then we use the same Bible we read the same passages, which you have heard and again, again and again. But the marvelous thing about the word of God is that every time we hear it, there is something new. There is something new that the Lord tells each of us according to our need, according to our disposition. You might have heard the same word yesterday or day before, but today the Lord tells you something more. If we are open to listen to the word of God. So don't put any obstacles. Oh, I have heard this before. Oh, I have heard this verse before. Oh, I have said this prayer before. No. There is a newness in Christ every day, every moment. So then, we start with the gospel verse in chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 and following. Now those who have the Bible, you can open. You can open and look at it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 and following. Jesus is passing through a place, very important place, called the Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is known for the number of, number of temples there. So many temples to every other god, any, any god they have heard, there is a temple to him. And there was a temple even dedicated to Caesar, who is not yet dead, who is ruling in Rome. Okay? And so when Jesus was passing that way, through Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples a very important question. Who do people say I am? They said, yeah, they say you are one of the prophets. Maybe you are John the Baptist or reborn. Maybe you are um, Jeremiah, etc. They must have given their versions. Then he asked this important question. Who do you say I am? That's a very important question which Jesus asked the disciples and he's asking you, asking me today, who am I for you? Simon Peter said, you are the, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And immediately Jesus tells him, Simon, don't think that you have said this by yourself. It is my father in heaven who has revealed this to you. And you are. Peter, on this church I will build, on this rock I will build my church. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, etc., etc., making Simon Peter the leader of the group because he professed Jesus as who he is. He understood. He was able to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah. So now, today, what's important for us is importance of knowing God, knowing about God. It has to be a real search, a serious search in our life to know God more and more. Now, one quotation I would like to give to you, if you have pen and paper, you can write down, okay? Because you can sit at home and read. This is from Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, in chapter 9, verse 23 to 24. Jeremiah 9, 23, 24. One of you like to read it? We are very slow in opening the Bible and reading. I tell you, if I am preaching to the Protestant group, before I finished the naming of the verse, they would already start reading it. Somebody or other from the crowd, they would read. We Roman Catholics, we are not so used to the Bible. But let us get used to it. Let us search. This is our treasure as much as the Holy Eucharist. The fathers of the church, like Tertullian, he says, we respect the Holy Spirit, the Holy Eucharist, with the same respect we must give to the word of God because this also is Jesus. Now we got? Please read. Read, read. the 
Thank you. Thank you so much. There is a new RSV version you have read. Uh, the translation is not that good, but uh, it's okay. So, what does it mean? Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. What should we glory in? Is it my wisdom? It is my degrees? Is it my knowledge? No. <laughs> Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Suppose you are a very strong man, athletic figure. And, you know, you are a weightlifter or you are a footballer or whatever, you are athletic. You are a strong person physically. Don't boast about that. It's no use. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. The riches can vanish. You know, Adani, what happened to him. You know, it can vanish very fast. It melts like uh, snow in the hot sun. So, do not glory in that. But let him who glories glory in this that he understands and knows me. God is saying, thus says the Lord, let him glory in this that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who practice steadfast love, justice and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. So to know God is absolutely important. That is why Jesus asked this question. Who do you say I am? Now suppose he asks you and me, what would we say? How much we know? Will we just give some quotation from the Bible? Oh, this is what St. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. This is what um, somebody else said. This is this saint said. Or do we have something to say from our heart? Do we have something to say? I'd like to read to you one verse from Philippians chapter 3, I think. Yeah, verse 7 and 8. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. What St. Paul says about the importance of knowing God. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. All that I had, I threw away, he says. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. The surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. It is worthwhile learning about Jesus. It is worthwhile knowing Jesus. And where do we know Jesus? We know Jesus through the word of God, through our prayer, through our experience. So, do we know Jesus enough? No, we don't. We don't. So then he says, For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as refuse in order that I may gain Christ. To gain Christ, to know Christ, to be united to Christ, to be one with Christ, that is what I want. That's what St. Paul says. We must become like that. We must not be half-baked charismatics. Yeah? Verse, three, uh, verse 7 and 8. Philippians 3, 7 and 8. Okay. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So to come to know God, we know that Jesus is the one who reveals the Heavenly Father. Why he came, not only to redeem us, but also to reveal the Heavenly Father, to make known the Father. And there's a beautiful verse in John 1.18, which you must learn by heart. 1.18. Can you repeat it after me? No one has ever seen God. The only Son who lives in the bosom of the Father has made him known. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. No one has ever seen God. John, St. John is telling us. We have not seen God. Those time also people had not seen God. But the only Son, Jesus, where does he live? In the heart of the Father, in Sinu Patris, in the bosom of the Father. Shows the intimacy between the Father and the Son. He lives with the Father. The Father and the Son are one. And this love between them is the Holy Spirit. So this Holy Trinity is revealed to us by Jesus, who knows the Father intimately. So when he speaks about the Father, we must listen attentively. We also want to learn about the Father. In the Gospel of John in chapter 14, verse 7, is it? 
I don't get the exact numbers, forgive me. I'm not a Protestant pastor yet. You know, but please open St. John chapter 14 where there is a beautiful discussion going on between Jesus and his uh, disciples, okay? So there, uh, Jesus tells them, let not your hearts be troubled. Beautiful over starting of that chapter 14, isn't it? Believe in God, believe in me, and etc. Then at verse 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And uh, that is in response to Thomas, who said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, you know, when the conversation proceeds, there is another disciple, Philip, verse 8. He says, Lord, show us the Father, and we shall be satisfied. Because Jesus repeatedly speaks about the Father. My Father's kingdom, my Father's glory, I and my Father are one. Uh, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. About, about the Heavenly Father, revealing the Heavenly Father is what Jesus wants to do. So Philip is very curious. Show us the Father and we shall be satisfied. And Jesus says, Have I been with you so long, Philip, yet you do not know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the sake of the works. So in this way, Jesus reveals the heavenly Father to us. And he brings us into intimacy with the Father. Now this is what we must examine. We are, of course, good Christians. We go for confession. We go for holy mass. We don't commit big, uh, terrible sins, mortal sins, and all that, maybe. And we feel quite complacent. Okay, not too bad. And I'm also in the charismatic group. Guys, go ahead. Okay, okay, that's fine. Is that enough? Is that enough? We must grow in our intimacy with God. Never be satisfied. God is infinite. There is still more still more to learn, still more to love. And it is through Jesus alone that we can come to the Heavenly Father. All the great saints, Teresa of Avila and the Catherine of Siena, who teach us about prayer, says, it is only through the sacred humanity of Christ that we can approach the Heavenly Father. So let us look at Jesus more and more, and we shall come to know the Father. In the Old Testament, there are many descriptions of God as a loving God. Of course, you are familiar with these. Uh, let's just go through some of them, just to mention them. Isaiah 43, 4. Isaiah 43, 4. Anybody knows that by heart? And it's a gist of it. Isaiah 43, 4. You must have heard it hundreds of times in charismatic convention. Hmm? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. Everybody is precious to God. Equally precious. There is no difference. A priest and a lay person. What's the difference? If a priest is told to do ministerial priesthood, a lay person also shares in the priesthood of Christ. Once we are dead and gone to heaven, we will all be same. Male and female, young and old, lay and uh, cleric, holy father and you, we are all same. God loves everyone equally. He does not know any other measure totally. How much did he love the Blessed Virgin Mary, his own mother? The same love he is giving to you and me. Okay? As much as he loved Mother Mary, so does he love you. That's why everybody is precious. Even the worst rotten sinner to him is precious, honored, and loved. Kadirun of Siena says, if I were the only sin sinner in this world, my Jesus would come and die and save me. Every person is like that. <coughs> then Isaiah 43, 25. I'm a forgiving God. I'm a forgiving God, he says. 49, 15, of course, every one of you know, especially the mothers will know. 
Isaiah 49, 15. 49, 15. The mother should know this, otherwise there's shame on you. Huh? Can a woman? And then I have engraved you. Okay, so that is really wonderful, isn't it? Can a mother forget the child that she is nursing? She is feeding at the breast. And still can she forget him or her? Even if she forgets, I will not forget, says the Lord. I have engraved you, I have written you, I have scribbled you, your name in the palm of my hand. And you are constantly before me. In the Old Testament, God said this. Isaiah 54.10, the mountains may depart, the hills be turned to clay, yet my love for you will be still everlasting. And uh, Isaiah 58.9, when you call me, I will answer, here I am. Call on me and I will say, here I am, he says. Okay, just a few more verses quickly. Mika, chapter 7, verse 18 and 19. So where is Mika? One of the small Old Testament prophets, you know. I have in my Bible, I have uh, printed out and pasted here the names of the prophets and all that so I can open easily. Huh? Mika, chapter... Chapter 7, 18 and 19. Chapter 7, 18, 19. Yeah, okay, that's enough. So it says that he is a God of compassion who pardons iniquity, who removes our sinfulness. He has compassion upon us. So it is a compassionate, saving, loving God that we have in the Old Testament even. And there are more references there if you like to just write down Ezekiel 33.11. Ezekiel 33.11, it says... I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked man. Rather, let him turn from his evil ways and live. That is what I want, he says. Not to punish the wicked man. Then uh, we have uh, in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 onwards, shows, when I think of him, he says, Ephraim, uh, my heart recoils within me. I, I draw him with the bands of compassion, cords of love, he says. And when I think of punishing him, I said, no, no, I cannot. My guts move within me to compassion. So God is using very human terminology to say how much he loves. He is a compassionate God. So we have in Jesus. All that is said in the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus. Everywhere we see Jesus going about when we read the Gospels. Whenever he is anyone in suffering, Jesus has compassion. Just take the for example the, uh, that woman from nine, the widow of nine. You find her in chapter seven of Saint Luke somewhere. Her only son had died, and the people were carrying the dead body of that son for burial. And this woman is walking behind, weeping, weeping. And Jesus comes from the opposite direction. He, he sees this crowd. He feels compassion. What does Jesus do? He goes and touches the coffin. And the coffin bearers stood still. He stops them from moving. He touches the coffin. They stop. And then he tells the young man, young man, I tell you, get up. He took him by the hand and he woke up. The dead man woke up and he presented him to his own mother, the mother of this man, the widow of nine. So this is how Jesus dealt with people. In the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 2, isn't it? A leper comes to Jesus. Huh? A 
leper comes to Jesus and says, Lord, if you wish, you can heal me. Oh, it is chapter 1, sorry. Chapter 1, verse 40 onwards. A leper comes and says, Lord, if you wish, you can heal me. Now, this is a very strange thing because a leper is not supposed to come before any human being. A leper is supposed to live in the leper colony. And uh, when he comes out from there, he must shout, unclean, 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 so that people may hear and may not come near him. But here is a leper who takes the courage. He has heard about Jesus. He believes in Jesus. And through the crowd somehow, even though he can be punished for doing that, he comes and tells Jesus, Lord, if you believe, you can heal me. What did Jesus do? Jesus said, yes, that is what I, what I want. And he touched him and he healed him. Of course, the gospel writer writes, he touched him. I'm sure Jesus must have hugged him. Because that is what Jesus would do. And the leprosy left that person immediately. The compassion of Jesus. Thank God we don't have leprosy. We don't have this kind of problem. But we have interior dispositions which are sometimes making us feel unclean like the leprosy. Unwanted, unloved. And um, in hopeless situations, sometimes, even the best of us can experience that sometimes. Come to Jesus. His compassion will cover us and save us. So we must discover this Jesus. What's wrong with us? Why is it that we are not really intimate with God? The reason is our sinfulness, nothing else. We say every now and then no to God. What is sinfulness? Sinfulness is just nothing else but refusal to love. A refusal to love God, a refusal to love other people. And when we do that, we are running away from God. You know the story of Adam and Eve, isn't it? In the Genesis chapter 3, right? In Genesis chapter 3, after they commit sin, they listen to the devil rather than God. That's their sinfulness. The devil said, no, no, you will not die. And they believed that. God said, you don't eat that because that is dangerous, you will die. The devil says, no, 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 you will not die. If you eat that fruit, you will become like God. God doesn't want you to become like him. That's why he said, don't eat that. You will become like God, knowing good and evil. You will be powerful. You will be like God. You will be another God. So eat it. And fruit looks so nice to eat. So looks so appealing. So poor lady, uh, Eve, no. You can't blame her. You would have done the same. She plucked it and Oh, it's wonderful, so tasty, delicious. Hey, Adam, eat this man. Then he gives to him. Adam, foolish fellow, without knowing what it is, took it and ate. And as he swallowed, he became aware, I have sinned. She became aware. They said, we are naked. Oh, they went and took out some big leaves, fig leaves, and made aprons for themselves, and then they hid behind the bushes. When we commit sin, we run away from God. God does not run away from us. God is not hiding from us. No. We are hiding from God. And that God comes looking for us. Adam, where are you? Normally they walk together. This evening when God came to walk for evening walk, Adam and Eve are not seen. Adam, where are you? He says, we are here. We saw that we were naked, so we hid. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten that fruit I forbade you to eat? And he should have said, my Lord, I'm so sorry. Abba, forgive me. Instead of that, what does he do? As we do. This woman, whom you gave to me, put with me, she gave to me and I ate. So the fault is hers or the fault is yours. Who told you to give me that woman? So we put blame on others. We put blame on God. So many times we blame God for what is wrong with us. Isn't it? What did you do, my child? God asked Eve. He said, it's not my fault. That devil, that, that serpent beguiled me and I yet. So there start the story. We running away from God. Every time, every time we commit a sin, we are running away from God. But God does not give up. Thank God he doesn't give up. That's why we are here. He doesn't give up. 
Even though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. There God says, chapter 1 begins with telling us what a thing has happened. Uh, donkey knows its master, a bull knows its master, but my people do not know. They have ab abandoned me and all that, that God complains. And then at the end he says, you come back to me, even if your sins are like scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. If you repent and come back, that's what he says. And that's what we read in John 3.16, which all of us should know by heart, isn't it? Of course we know. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that those who believe in him may not perish but may have eternal life. And God sent his son not to condemn the world but just to save the world through him. So God is loving a sinful world, wanting to save. If you feel you are sinful, God is loving you. He wants to save you. And John 1, 11, 12. What must we do in order to be saved? John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. He came to his own. His own people received him not. He came to his own home. His own people received him not. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. So what we need to do is to receive Jesus, to welcome Jesus into our homes, into our life, and then he will give us the power to become children of God. I think we need a, a little break. Um, can we sing one song? Will you sing one song with me? I will try to teach you one song. Very simple Hindi song. But you have to stand up. And uh, you have to make a little space between your chair. You know, a little, little movement is needed there. Okay? Some movement. Do you have a cordless mic? No. Um, can you give me a mic which I can hold in the hand?
के प्रभु की स्तुति गाए कूद कूद के प्रभु की स्तुति गाए कूद कूद के प्रभु की स्तुति गाए कूद कूद के प्रभु की स्तुति गाए काली बजा के प्रभु की स्तुति गाए काली बजा के स्तुति गाए ताली बजा के प्रभु की स्तुति गाए हाले लोया 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 ओके सिट डाउन सिट डाउन Just say Hail Mary silently when I will drink the water. Okay. So I am taking you through the Word of God. because the word of god is the greatest teacher i am not your teacher the holy spirit is your teacher the word of god is your teacher that's why we must go more and more into the word have you met this forgiving jesus personally have you met forgiving jesus you might ask me how you met him i can tell you my testimony but you might get scandalized If you promise that you will not get scandalized I will tell you will you get scandalized okay I was living in New Delhi as a young man I was 18 19 and I was an ex seminarian okay I was I was with the Salishians and 6 uh, years I studied there and I said I am going I don't want this because I was getting upset I was quarreling with the superiors for everything and I found it very difficult to obey and um, i said i am going i came down from there went to manipur worked in a school because i knew english more or less uh, in manipur we can teach provided you have a language you don't need qualifications i was not even a graduate so i was teaching english grammar in the high school as soon as i finished my graduation I came to New Delhi, where my uncle was living. He said, "You can come after your graduation. I will find you a good job." I reached New Delhi. He said, "I can get you a job tomorrow. You will be a clerk in some office, and you will get frustrated within a few days. So, don't be in a hurry to get a job. You study for the civil service IAS examination because your English is good, and I will support you. I will pay all the expenses." I never thought of that in my life till that day. I said okay. He was encouraging me, so I went for tuition, coaching class for international law. Then I went to the library to study psychology and European history. These were my subjects in those days, the first years. Not now. Now there is preliminary and final. In those days, there was only one exam, eight papers we have to write. So I was getting ready for that. On Sundays, we used to go to church. That's all. On Sunday, when I went to church. the old man the priest was a jerum toner he said come here come here so i told him can you read the second reading today i said yes father i can do that so the first reading some girl read second reading i read after i finished reading i was going back to sit can we just stay on there's nobody to serve at the altar you know so i stayed on i gave him the water and wine and washing hands and everything there i am staying there so mass went on and communion time came and he distributed communion told me hold the communion plate so i was holding the communion plate and having a great entertainment because in vasant vihar where we have the dominican church is a posh area all the rich people and the diplomats they are all there some african ladies you know rolling round and coming and some indian ladies also with plindio rouge and lipstick and very good looking 
and all this, I was looking at them and, um, you know, being entertained in that way. That's why I said, don't get scandalized. So communion distribution is over. We taste the body of Jesus. And we sleep the body of Christ. I looked. I said, no need, Father. No need. So we put it back. Mass got over. We went home. I was so restless. I could not sit at home. I was feeling so very uncomfortable. I said, Jesus came, he said, body of Christ. I said, no. I refused to welcome Jesus. I could not because I had not made confession for I don't know when I made confession, you know. So how can I simply receive communion? That was some kind of Christianity was still in me. Uh, so I was quite happy with the Sunday Mass, no communion. But then this day, Jesus said, I want to come into your heart. In the evening around 4 o'clock, I told my auntie, auntie, I'm just going out. So I took the cycle. I had a nice cycle with the gear and all that in those days. I pedaled to the church. Went to the room of this father and knocked, talk, talk, talk. Come in, he said, come in. So I opened the door and went inside. He was sitting, yeah, just as you have, what happened? I knelt down. I said, Father, I want to make my confession. Oh, good, good, good. Let me get the stool. So he got the stool, put it on, and I made my confession. That is one moment when I met Jesus. That day when he said, the body of Christ. And I felt I could not welcome him. <laughs> and I felt sorry. And the Lord touched me that day. Something very simple, isn't it? Nothing very extraordinary. No lightning striking and no big thunder and all these things. But that simple gesture of that priest offering me the body of Christ and I saying, no need, Father. Then that prompted me to make a good confession. That changed my life a little bit. Not that immediately I started becoming a, you know, holy soul. No, I have to struggle with my sinfulness for a long time. And after a number of years, after I got my job, five years I worked in the central government. Then I still felt the call of the Lord. I went and asked him, Father, what do you say? I was in a religious congregation, Don Bosco, Salutations of Don Bosco. After six years, I left. I still feel I must become a priest. You think I have a vocation? Oh, justice, that is wonderful to hear. I do not know. We'll ask the provincial when he comes. So the provincial came after some time. He called me. The provincial is here. Provincial gave me a big interview because I am used to facing interview. I faced IAS interview, so I can face the provincial's interview, I said. So he asked me a number of questions. I asked and I answered very well. And he said, let me get an okay from your old provincial solution. See, they say, okay, then I will take you. And so they did not have any objection. And I joined. Immediately I was sent to the novitiate. And then after that theology, within five years, I was ordained a priest in 1988 on 1st May. So there we are. God has a plan for every one of us. He allows us to go through various ways, crooked ways. But then he draws the way straight in our life. So what I want to ask you is, I can say 100% I have met Jesus. Not that I am a very intimate friend of Jesus. I am still struggling. Have you met Jesus? I am sure you have had experiences similar to mine or even greater experiences. You must treasure those experiences. And if you have not had, then the Lord is still waiting call you to himself. Like St. Thomas the Apostle, the unbelieving Thomas, John 20, 28. Thomas, come here. Put your hand in my heart. Touch me. Do not be unbelieving. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. The greatest expression in the New Testament about the divinity of Jesus came from the unbelieving Thomas. See, that's what God turns everything. Anybody else could have said, my Lord and my God, but no. The one who did not believe that Jesus rose again, he is made to say, my Lord and my God. Saint Thomas. Saint Paul. Another man who persecuted Christians, who hated Christ. He didn't want anybody to take the name of Christ. What happened to him? He was converted. 
And what beautiful things he writes. Galatians 2.20. This is my favorite verse among St. Paul. What is Galatians 2.20? Anybody with the Bible? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Christ lives in me. The Son of God. And my life from now is my faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. My life from now is my faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So I want to be with him, crucified with him. Then in Colossians 3.3 3 he says, Our life is hid in God with Christ. Our life is hid with God in Christ. And Philippians 1.21, I'm telling you these verses, you can write down, you can look at them at home and meditate on them. Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ. Christ is the meaning of my life, otherwise I have no life. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That means I'm waiting for that day when he will take me and reveal himself 100% to me. We shall look at him and see him as he is because we shall become like him. So, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then, the confidence of St. Paul. Philippians 3.14, 3.13 I can do, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. And one more verse, Romans 8.35. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? And he gives a number of things. None of these, neither anything in heaven or on earth or under the earth can separate us from the love of Christ, he says. So Christ has grasped St. Paul so well he is united with Christ. What about you and me? How close or how distant are we from Christ? What is the intensity of our relationship with God? Our life, meaning of our life depends on that. Are we just satisfied with a mere exterior relationship like when you get ready to come to the church, some people, you know, we put on like makeup and all that. Some people put a lot of putty and all that and then little lipstick and some rouge and then the last thing is take that perfume, this thing and all that. So is our religiosity just the little perfume that we put outside to go about smelling well before people? Is that our religiosity or is it something deep? Are we in the bosom of the Heavenly Father with Christ, looking up at him and saying, Abba, Father. John chapter 1, verse 1 onwards, what we read, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The Word was with God. Dele Pottery, one of the commentators, he says, it is not just uh, God is here and the Word is here. No. That dynamic relationship between the Word and God, the Father and the Son, it is into that relationship which is love, that is the Holy Spirit that he has brought us into by his death and resurrection and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So what should we do? We must look for him before anything else. Matthew 6.33 I'm telling you a verse which is everybody's, you know, everybody knows this. What is 6.33? Hey. You are very good in finding and reading. But what about by heart? Huh? Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all else will be given to you. You know? Yeah. So, are we seeking this first? Is it the first thing in our life? Our love for God will be reflected in our life in the love for others. So are we really with God? If you are with God, 
you cannot but love every human being if we fail in loving human beings that means there is something wrong with our relationship with god even if you put away one human being out of the all humanity that one no i don't want anything to do with it we are not loving god we are only cheating god we are not loving god we must love even the worst of enemies as not jesus said love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you become perfect as your heavenly father is perfect matthew 5:48 perfect in his love and forgiveness that's what we must become so we have to make a very special effort that's what god is asking and he uses this terminology all your heart with all your heart and i want to give you the quotation from the bible where he says about this all your heart deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 29 deuteronomy 4:29 god says hear o israel the lord your god is one god you shall love the lord with all your heart with all your soul with all your strength etc and that these words which i teach you you shall lay them in your heart and teach them to your children shall write them on your walls etc he gives you know so with all your heart you shall love the lord jeremiah 29:11 jeremiah 29:11 you shall seek me and you shall find me when you seek me with all your heart a person who sought jesus with all her heart was mary magdalene she is the first one to see the resurrected jesus the sinner woman from whom jesus had chased seven devils only as written in the gospel of luke i think isn't it and that woman was able to see jesus first jeremiah 29:11 you shall find me if i if you seek me with all your heart and then tobit 1:13:6 tobit 13:6 also speaks about that no tobit 13:6 Jeremiah 29:11 Deuteronomy 4:28 So one measure of our relationship with God is how much we communicate with God When we love people we communicate with those people Sometimes with words sometimes with gestures sometimes even without words and gestures the mere presence looking into the face of another person whom you love you can communicate I don't know they say husbands or wife are husbands and wives are like that they don't need to speak many words when you know that your husband is upset he does not need to say my dear darling i feel upset today when you look at his face you know something is wrong with this man something is deeply wrong with this man even without words similarly the other way also usually women are more perceptive than men am i right i don't know but gentlemen also if you look carefully you will find that when your wife or your child is upset you will notice at once when you are happy also you will notice at once hey what is it you today you are becoming a little extra jumpy hey what happened did someone call you did your son call you uh, did you get a visit from somebody or uh, have you got a promotion you will certainly ask so communication is not necessarily through words even a gesture is enough even a touch gentle touch on the shoulder is enough that way we communicate with one another now how do we communicate with god we say it is through prayer now this word prayer somehow i find is a very dry kind of word when we say prayer we sometimes get frightened oh am i able to pray i cannot pray i don't want to pray it is a very tough job you send me out for a walk i don't mind but to sit and pray is very difficult is like some students in the seminary some seminarians you know you send them out to dig in the field to do cultivation they are happy to do come and sit down and study with with us they are shifting around they cannot they find very difficult to concentrate on study some of them they are ready to do anything any hard work so prayer is like that difficult but do i seek help the greatest help we can is the word of god in prayer even these verses which you have heard today if you just go through them lovingly wanting to know god you will be praying we can also pray with people 
No, why we are gathered together as carriers going to you. And alone we find difficult to pray. When we come together, everyone's faith increases my faith. No, we share our faith together. That is like the upper room, like Mother Mary and the disciples gathered together in prayer. We sing and we praise together. We help each other. We intercede for each other. We become one in Christ. So we pray with people. We can also with pray with nature. Look at the sea. Look at the waves. Look at the birds. Look at the flowers. So here we don't see too many birds and too many flowers and all that because it's an arid place, isn't it? But if you go to Mangalore or Goa and to Kerala and all that, you will find more greenery there. We can pray. Even in the desert, we can pray because some of the ancient saints went to, went to the desert. Isn't it? Now, when am I supposed to stop? What time am I supposed to stop? One o'clock. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Are you tired? A little bit. Okay. So, let us continue with this one. The simplest way to pray is to call on the name of Jesus. We must develop a very personal love for the name of Jesus. Suppose your girlfriend's name is this or your boyfriend's name is this. If you really fall in love and, and you get married, you really love that name. And you have very special ways of calling that name also. Isn't it? I don't know how you call each other. When you go back home, your husbands and wives and all that, you examine how you call I remember my uncle, her, uh, his wife's name was Teyama. Te my mother's name is also Teyama. Teyama is uh, Malayalam. Uh, it means Teresa. Okay? So uncle used to call her Tame. Teyama becomes Tama. You know, diminutive. To show the, the sweetness in that. When he wants something, a special cup of tea, Tame. You know? So otherwise Teyama. Otherwise Tame. So like that, you know, when you call people with intimacy, you call each other like that. Do we have that kind of a feeling towards Jesus when we call him? Jesu, Jesu Mare, I don't know how you call. How did Mother Mary call Jesus? She must have called with such sweetness. Ask her to teach you to call Jesus. She's the one who heard his name first. Luke one thirty one. You shall conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call him Jesus. He will be great. He will sit on the throne of David. He will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom shall have no end. She says, how can this be? I do not know man. I am only a betrothed. I am not married. The Holy Spirit will come upon me. So the story goes on. The Annunciation. She heard the name Jesus. And then finally she said, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. And what happened? She became pregnant. Jesus came into her body, into her mind, into her heart. And she knows now the Lord is with me, the Son of God. And what does she do? She only knows his name. She calls that name Jesus. My Jesus. My little baby Jesus. And she calls him. She adores him. She loves him waits for him to be born. Can you just imagine the relationship between Mother Mary and Jesus in her womb? The little fetus growing up. How she adored and loved. It is really a contemplative relationship. Without seeing, without hearing, what absolute union with the divine. So can we take that? You receive Jesus today in the most holy sacrament. He has united himself to you in your body, becoming flesh of your flesh and blood of your blood. He has united himself to you in your heart and mind and in your soul, in the sanctuary of your soul. Are we able to say, oh Jesus? As she says. Saint Joseph is another one, Matthew 121. Joseph, son of David. You are supposed to put away Mother Mary thinking she has uh, done some mistake anyway. I don't want her to be stoned to death. Let me quietly put her away. That's what he was saying. But he was a holy man praying about it and going to sleep. And the angel says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, 
for that which is conceived within her is from the holy spirit she will bear a son you shall call him jesus for he will save his people from their sins joseph woke up from sleep immediately went to the house of mary and said mary please come with me my doors are open the lord has told me what has happened to you joseph also joined mary to adore jesus and once he is born he becomes their joy so calling on the name of jesus with earnestness with sweetness and saint paul encourages us in romans 10:13 romans 10:13 he says quoting from joel prophet joel that is verse 232 anyone who calls upon the name of the lord will be saved anyone who calls upon the name of the lord will be saved because as saint joseph is told shall call him jesus for he shall save his people from their sins the meaning of jesus is yahweh saves call on jesus he will be saved okay yeah so how to call on jesus in that way we need the help of the holy spirit Romans 8:26 to 28 We do not know how to pray as we ought so the holy spirit helps us to pray beyond words with sighs beyond words according to god's will praise the lord, praise the lord. Hallelujah. hallelujah we need another song our songsters are gone Okay. All right. <clears throat> we will sing um Consolingly. You can sing without instruments also, no? Which is a song that you are familiar with? Huh? Come on, start. Stand, stand, stand. Clap your hands and start. सु है कैसा कुमार भैया ऐसो है कैसा कुमार काला बनाया काला बनाया गोरा बनाया ऐसा बनाया ऐसा बनाया कैसा बनाया अच्छा बनाया ऐसो है कैसे कुमार येसु है कैसा कुम्हार येसु है कैसा कुम्हार भैया येसु है कैसा कुम्हार नाया ना बनाया लंबा बनाया छोटा बनाया कैसा बनाया अच्छा बनाया जैसा बनाया अच्छा बनाया येसु है कैसे कुमार भैया येसु है का बनार येसु है कैसे कुसु के कैसे कुमार प्रेज लॉर्ड और भी बोल सकता है मोटा बनाया दुबला बनाया है ना या 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 हो सकता है नो प्रॉब्लम दैट्स ओके या Let's say a little prayer before we conclude, isn't it? We shall pray. Abba, loving Father, thank you for this delightful evening when you spoke to us through the Word of God. Thank you for sending your Son Jesus. Thank you for saving us from our sinfulness. Thank you for the gift of repentance the gift of reconciliation Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit 
who sanctifies us, who opens our eyes and our ears and our hearts to understand your love for us in Jesus, enabling us to reciprocate that love, to call you Abba, as Jesus calls you, to call Jesus Jesus as Mother Mary calls him and to say the Holy Spirit, Spirit of love, abide in us. O most holy Trinity, our Lord and our God, thank and praise you, Lord. Warm our hearts, Lord, that we may eagerly listen to your word. As the disciples said in the upper room when they met the resurrected Jesus on the way to Emmaus and when he disappeared, were not our hearts burning within us when he explained to us the scriptures? And they too left the upper room and went to meet the other disciples to tell them that they have seen the Lord. Today, we want to see you, Lord, and we want to tell others how we have seen you, to encourage them, to bring them to the fold, to love them and save them, as Jesus tells us to do. Make us instruments of your love, Lord, and for that, give us an experience of your closeness to us today, at this moment and every moment of our life. Wherever we go, be it into our homes or into our office spaces or into open spaces, help us to radiate the love that you implant in us. Let the Holy Spirit shine forth through our faces, through our words, through our gestures, our actions. Make us more and more like your son, Jesus. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. upon all these petitions from all the people of all the kingdom and place them here. That whatever we ask in the most holy name of Jesus with faith, believing in his words that where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in the midst of them. If you agree among yourselves and ask anything, my heavenly Father will give it to you. One minute, please sit down. Uh, you know, Father is available here till uh, 3rd of March. He is here. He is staying here. You know that. If daytime, if anyone required the counseling from him, he is available. And you need to contact Sister Angela, 9953-6411. 9953-6411. WhatsApp number, you can contact and get the appointment to get the uh, uh, appointment for the counseling. So, Father's class is there tomorrow also evening time from 4.30 to 7, here only in uh, room number 7, 4.30 to 7. Then we will have uh, anointing prayer at 6.30. Father will uh, bless each one of us, those who are attending tomorrow, uh, laying of hands there, 6.30. From 4.30 to 7, we have Father's session. 
then important thing on 26th 26th sunday there is a daytime retreat there in salmia parish from 9 am to 2 pm 9 am to 2 pm say holy day for everyone the uh, liberation day 26th of this month sunday so please join in salmia bring more people there it's a holy day you know with, with that uh, you know, let all bring together to, to uh, closeness with uh, jesus so we can make use of uh, sunday 26 by 2 o'clock it will finish okay yeah it's ah uh, it's a sunday obligation mass is there and it start with the yeah we will start rosary and uh, mass please join on 26 tomorrow tomorrow mass is not there evening 4:30 to 7 in room number 7 up, upstairs so you adjust uh, because there is the masses are there from morning time is there you attend the mass in the morning and come for 4:30 session clear no praise the lord god bless you all